Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our first seminar series of 2014. Um, this is our political engagement today, and we've got Dr. Mary Hall from the University of Edinburgh and Dr. Nathan Manning from the University of York. So let's give a really big warm welcome and uh, here we go. Hi everybody, it's uh, nice to, to see you all here and thank you very much for inviting us to, to talk to you about our work. What we want to do is talk to you about a project that we've done on political uh, dissatisfaction and for the purposes of today we've called it I'm Not Bothered. Um, and it's something that this notion of political dissatisfaction, you might have come across it recently in a variety of forms, one of which is Russell Brand talking about uh, him uh, not voting and, and how he doesn't feel like uh, he wants to, to vote. But that's not the only indicator, some celebrity saying that they're, they're not interested in voting. Uh, there are statistics that tell us that there's a more general tendency uh, towards uh, disengaging from mainstream politics. And um, what we wanted to do was to try and understand that political uh, disengagement in more sociological terms. You can see in this uh, graph that we have here that in particular, if the table's not in the way, uh, since the 1990s there's been a very sharp drop in uh, turnout at elections, which is one indication of the uh, discontent that, that people feel with mainstream politics. Although it's picked up a little bit recently, that's picking up from a pretty low uh, base there in 2001. So how might we try and understand uh, this more sociologically and why do we need to do that? Well because most of the analysis of this phenomenon has been quantitative and it's been based within uh, political science and we would argue that sociology can bring some new insights uh, to this uh, problem and, and help us see it in a, in a different light. And within our own work uh, there are some theoretical insights which we argue can be brought to this area. We're not going to talk about those in any detail today, but feel free to ask us more if you want. One of those um, the theoretical areas that we draw on is, the, is political sociology, and in particular we're interested in uh, applying some of the ideas of political sociology to mainstream politics. Uh, so a lot of uh, political sociology has attended to social movements, for example, and uh, we want to, to put the focus back on to, to mainstream politics. Um, we also theoretically draw on insights from the sociology of emotion, and uh, that's an area that we think can tell us a lot about why people feel disengaged, disconnected from uh, the political system as it uh, currently exists. And we also think that sociology is important. Um, it, it's important within sociology to study the more ordinary and everyday and less exciting aspects of, of social life. So to study why people are not interested in politics might be sociologically interesting. We think that there is, it is important to look at the more mundane uh, aspects of everyday life including uh, why pe how people feel about um, their, their, their disengagement from politics. And in uh, exploring political dissatisfaction, we bring to bear a, a more qualitative approach, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And that approach um, allows us to gather some, some findings which tell us more about the experiences of people uh, in uh, political um, engagement or disengagement and that is something that it's um, important to know that by listening to people talk about their own experiences of political disengagement we can um, get some insights that can't be got in other ways so that is, is very important. So um, to provide you with a little bit of context um, I've got some, some recent data here about um, turnout 
basically. And turnout's one of the key ways in which um, we measure electoral participation and disengagement. Um, and here we're looking in particular at propensity to vote. So um, this is, we've got data here from the Hansard Society uh, Audit of Political Engagement, which covers 2004 to 2013. So very current data. And you can see that in the last couple of years we've, we've seen, had a further drop off uh, of people you know, willing to vote, saying that they're, they're, they're keen to vote. Um, and if you dig a little bit deeper, you can see that over this time period, this nine year time period, we've got a 10% drop in those who say that they're absolutely certain to vote. Um, the middle bit sort of stays fairly constant, those who are likely to vote. But you get quite an increase um, in the people who are unlikely to vote or absolutely certain not to vote. There's almost a doubling in that nine year period. Um, so there's, there's some, some evidence to suggest that uh, electoral disengagement is particularly acute at the moment. Um, and probably many of you are aware that electoral disengagement is something that's particularly pronounced amongst young people. Um, so young people are, compared to other age groups, are much less likely to vote, for example. They might be engaged in other ways, but voting is not one that holds a lot of appeal for them. Uh, so from this recent data, we can see that just 12% of 18 to 24-year-olds were certain to vote, and that's a 10% drop on the year before, 2012. So that gives you a bit more context for that. Of course, turnout um, and you know, propensity to vote uh, is just sort of one of the ways in which we, we measure uh, disengagement. The other kinds of things that we often look at, or political engagement more, more usually, are uh, things like trust in government, politicians, various uh, political activities, you know, signing petitions, going to public meetings, these kinds of things. Uh, political interest and knowledge. Um, but this gives you a, a flavour of the kind of work that's out there. If we look beyond the UK, because that's what we're just looking at, some very good uh, recent data from the UK, you can see there's been a decline in electoral turnout across the OECD. So uh, the table here shows data from 1980 to the most recent election. And this came out, this research came out in 2011, so, you know, again, quite recent data. So across the OECD, turnout's down by 11%. Um, and obviously there's some variation, you can see that. Uh, some countries have um, much larger um, decline in turnouts and some have actually had an increase in turnout. Uh, so jurisdictions are going to be important in, in thinking about these things. Um, various national problems or issues are important as well. And just as a little uh, example that's close to my heart, um, in Australia it's actually uh, compulsory to turn out to vote. Um, you can be fined if you don't turn out to vote. So when you get to the polling booth, you don't have to, you don't actually, you, whatever you do in the polling booth is up to you. You don't have to complete the ballot, uh, but you need to turn up and have your name ticked off. So in Australia we see no real change in three decades. And if we have a look down to the UK, um, and this reflects the, the graph that Mary had up on the first slide. You can see there's been a decline of 15% in those three decades. So this is a sort of a general pattern that we can see across many established democracies. Um, and these kinds of statistics looking at turnout, propensity to vote, and these kind of standard measures um, <coughs> tend to come out of political science. Um, and they very rarely ask citizens to provide accounts of why they might be disengaged. So you might have seen the, uh, the recent Guardian survey, which did ask people why they weren't voting, and that's quite an exceptional piece of uh, statistical research. That, that's usually not, not done in this kind of quantitative, uh, these kind of quantitative approaches. Um, and you know, significantly, because this work is typically survey-based and quantitative, citizens are very rarely given an opportunity to talk about why they might um, participate or choose not to participate in their own words. So we don't hear much about the sort of texture of engagement and disengagement. So that's what we decided that we'd try and do, that we'd try and talk to people about uh, how they feel about mainstream politics. And we're particularly interested in people who were not interested in politics. But um, 
in talking to you about our, our method, I want to highlight that we really would encourage you not to try any of the things that we tried. Um, we, in reflecting upon our methods, would probably do things really quite differently. Um, <coughs> we did a cold canvas uh, study and uh, that kind of cold had a double meaning in that sense because we went out and spoke to people cold, uh, complete strangers on the street, uh, and we did it in January. Not a very smart thing to do uh, in the places where we were looking uh, for disengagement, uh, and those places were um, Burnley, Barnsley, Doncaster and Hull. Uh, which are fine places to be, as you can see in January from our uh, photographs. Now, why did we go there? We went there because initially our interest in this arose when the BNP uh, had, uh, were successful in having two members elected to the European Parliament in 2009. And those um, MPs were in uh, Yorkshire and Humber, and the North East. Uh, and so those two um, European electorates include the areas of Burnley, um, Barnsley, Doncaster and Hull. But what also marks those areas uh, is the fact that they have pretty low uh, voter turnout as well as fairly high support for the BNP. And in the end we decided we were not so interested in the support for the BNP but in that as another indicator of people's dissatisfaction with mainstream politics and political parties. So we used um, a, a poll that indicated uh, who BNP supporters might be and gave us an idea of the kinds of occupations they might be in. And we also were reading literature which, which suggested there was particular concern about the white working classes. Now that's a very loaded category that we, we're not going to get into debates about that now. So what we did was we kind of said, OK, well, is it working class people, um, white working class people that are more likely to be disengaged? Uh, if so, what might those kinds of people have to say about their disengagement? So it was, it was a rather kind of quick and dirty way to try and get to some people who might tell us something about why they were not interested in politics. But if you've ever tried to convince people to talk to you about something they're not interested in, uh, then you'll see another of the problems with doing uh, the research in, in this way, of walking up to people in the street and going, would you like to tell us why you're not interested in, in politics is perhaps uh, a slightly crazy way to go about it. Amazingly enough, uh, we did actually uh, manage to find some people. We, we used the occupation, we went into um, hairdressers, uh, bars and cafes, we went into trade supply firms on industrial estates, we phoned plumbers and secretaries, we went into temp agencies to try and get access to sort of builders and other tradespeople who might fit within that white working class o o occupations. Um, and eventually 12 very kind people uh, took pity on us and agreed to, uh, to, to talk to us. So we're not making any grand claims from this research, it's a very small qualitative sample, but we think that it's important as a piece of exploratory research to, to give us an idea of the kinds of insights we might get into people's um, experiences of political uh, disengagement. The thing that is um, quite evident in the participants that we did manage to gather is that they're quite diverse in terms of age. Uh, their ages range from their early 20s to their 60s. Um, they mostly have, um, don't have higher education. There's two or three that do have undergraduate degrees, but as you can see, they haven't managed yet to translate those um, uh, university qualifications into higher paying or higher skilled jobs. They tend to be working in low skilled jobs and the most remarkable um, 
a feature of these participants is that they are all low wage. They are all earning below 30,000, which is roughly the annual, the uh, average wage at the time we did the research. And nearly all of them, except two, are earning below £20,000 a year. So they're definitely a low wage sample. Um, and they had some interesting things, I think, to tell us about their political disengagement. Indeed. Um, so one of the key findings that ran across the people that we spoke to was that rather than being apathetic, as perhaps you know, uh, white working classes are sometimes uh, positioned as, they were critically disengaged. Um, so we'll hear more about some of their criticisms of the system from Mary in a minute. Um, but they had a range of ways of sort of explaining their disengagement. Not everybody we spoke to was disengaged. Some people voted and were kind of relatively interested in politics. But um, everybody had criticisms. So here we have Josh um, saying that based on his experience of politics, you know, through the media and these kinds of things, he doesn't have much faith or interest in wanting to get to know more about it. He thinks it's all quite negative and really quite dark as well. Um, and another sort of quite a different example from Richard, he's really talking about party convergence. Um, and he's saying that he finds it difficult to differentiate between the policies of the Lib Dems, the Conservatives, and the Labour Party. Um, and he talks about the shift of Labour towards the right, and that there's not, not much electoral choice for him. It's quite uninspiring, he finds. So, I mean, these comments suggest a level of engagement and critique, which is just not fitting for apathy. So it's important to, to um, tease out the differences between a cynical approach and a, and a sort of cynicism and critical approaches to politics and, and apathy, sort of a disregard. Um, and the other really critical, um, using the word critical too much, the other very important thing about being attuned to this critical stance that these participants adopted is that it helps shift the responsibility for uh, disengagement away from kind of lazy, feckless, uh, ignorant individuals and pushes it back towards the institutions um, of government, politicians and governments themselves and ask questions about their ability to connect with citizens. And. A very important part of this uh, critical engagement, as um, Nathan has already hinted, was a, a, a criticism of the, the political system itself. So Katie, for example, makes what we could interpret as a, a criticism of the first-past-the-post system because she's saying that um, she's in Doncaster and Doncaster's a Labour stronghold, so her, her vote really isn't going to make any difference, whatever, whichever way she votes, it's not going to change um, who, who wins in Doncaster and, and what happens uh, as a result of that. Tom has a rather different basis for his criticism. He's critical of the way in which the, the political system is, is very removed from people and, and lacks a kind of participatory aspect. And he talks about this as being the original idea of politics and government, um, and that that's not kept to anymore. Now, he has a, a perhaps slightly romantic view of that uh, original idea of politics and government as being about people getting together in some kind of town hall meetings and bickering over what's best for the, the community or the, or the town. Um, but nevertheless, he's, he's trying there to make some criticism of the fact that that participation doesn't happen uh, today. And alternatively, Mark talks about the way in which the, the Labour Party has, has been a real disappointment and he feels quite frustrated at the way in which they have um, moved away from their support for the working class and the way in which they don't seem to look out for working people in the way that he thinks that they, they did in the past. And in particular, he's critical of the way in which they seem to have aligned themselves with 
with capital in a way that is indistinguishable from the Tories, so that they did nothing to regulate the banks at the time of the, the financial crisis, for example. So he sees that as, as really problematic, that, that the fact that the, the Labour Party isn't there for working people anymore, and he feels very frustrated and disappointed, and that's a um, really crucial part of his, his feelings of, of disengagement. Um, perhaps, as you, as you might expect, we, we did hear some racist talk during these interviews. Not, not in all of the interviews, but it certainly did come up. Um, and so here we have, we have Amy saying um, this is in response to a question about the sorts of issues and problems that politicians should be working on. And she thinks that politicians should more obviously be helping us that need it. Um, and she what she does is sort of pit a deserving us against an undeserving them. You know, and these sorts of comments are the kinds of things we're probably quite familiar with in, in the press. And, um, yeah. On the other hand, um, we have a, a different sort of uh, comment from John, but picking up on very similar themes. And here John's talking about his ambivalence about the BMP. Um, now, John, like everybody we spoke to, didn't care for the BNP. Uh, he wasn't an active supporter. Um, he thinks that they're too, too extreme, too right wing. Other people said that they were distasteful or they were sort of troublemakers or they caused riots and things. So we didn't, he wasn't a, an active supporter of the BNP. Um, but he has sympathy for some of the claims that they make um, and some of the, you know, the direction of their policies and things. Um, so he talks about when you listen to them speak, you do agree. Um, and he goes on to sort of broaden that out and say that he thinks these ideas have currency amongst lots of people. Lots of people share these kinds of ideas. It's just that the BNP articulate this in a very unpalatable kind of way, very extreme kind of right-wing racist sorts of ways. Um, now, we certainly don't um, have any interest in sort of being apologists for racism or racists. Uh, but we think it's important to look at what else is going on with some of this racist talk. Um, so we want to argue that class has been largely expunged from public and political dialogue and that there's very few resources available for people to uh, explain socioeconomic disadvantage. And so in that vacuum, some of the people we spoke to, but by no means all of them, uh, kind of drew upon these racist and racialized discourses about migrants. Um, but it's important to note that uh, you know, our participants are not the only ones making these kinds of claims, drawing on these kinds of racialized and racist <coughs> discourses. Uh, at the time, the BNP were kind of um, prominent purveyors of these kinds of ideas about undeserving migrants taking from deserving natives, if you like. Um, and, you know, if you, if you cast your minds back to the 2010 election, it wasn't just the BNP. Um, at the, 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 the leaders' debates, we had the mainstream major parties kind of trying to outdo each other on how tough they'd be on immigrants. You know, this was, a, this was quite a common theme. Um, and, of course, the tabloid press um, pushes these kinds of discourses as well, um, and they continue to. You know, we had all sorts of concern in the tabloid press about Bulgarians and Russians, you know, kind of flooding our borders quite recently. Um, and while the BNP might be a kind of spent political force in the UK, you know, sort of picking up, I guess, on on what John's saying here. Um, other people have entered into this space. So UKIP are probably a key example here that have kind of um, made very similar kinds of claims, similar kinds of talk to the BNP, but it's packaged in quite different ways and ways which you know, lots of people find more palatable. Perhaps people like John might find UKIP more palatable than the BNP. Um, and of course, UKIP have had, you know, uh, quite considerable success as well at the local level. It'll be interesting to see if they can uh, translate that at the more national level in, in a couple of years. 
So as well as uh, these kinds of racialized discourses, I think that we've highlighted that that might be one way in which the people we spoke to were trying to speak about the, the socio-economic disadvantage um, which is kind of central to their everyday lives. Uh, when we asked people what sort of problems uh, they thought politicians should be attending to, the first thing that nearly everybody said was something to do with with uh, money and with class. It was, you know, the government should deal with poverty, it should deal with low wages, it should deal with... Um, uh, yeah, any, anything to do with, with class and, and, and low wages and uh, that was really what was the first thing out of their, their mouths when we asked them. And part of their, their disengagement therefore was about feeling very disconnected from a political elite who seemed to have no real idea of the everyday struggles of living on a low wage. And Elizabeth talks about this in quite general terms, is about the, the MPs in government being in some kind of bubble and not being at all connected to uh, the ordinary person who is just trying to get along, muddle along with their daily lives and um, only comes up against officialdom when they're having to fight for something, some goal that they, that they want to achieve. And although the politicians might refer to the people, that's just a phrase, and there's a sense that that governing elite have re no real idea of ordinary people's lives. This is, uh, came through when we asked people what they thought of the different political leaders as well. And Doreen, for example, from Barnsley, when we asked her what she thought of David Cameron, said, oh, he's snooty him, um, and he'll not be really interested in ordinary people. So, oops, sorry. Um, Similarly, Mick, when talking about uh, David Cameron, suggests that he wasn't just born with a silver spoon in his mouth, it was the whole damn cutlery tray. And that what could a guy like that ha know about the, what someone like Mick, an ordinary guy like Mick, um, wants from his local community? And this phrase, you know, ordinary, ordinary person, was, was used over and over again to kind of refer to... Um, people who were from the same kind of backgrounds as, as those we, we spoke to. So this disconnection from the political elite who were seen as you know, wealthy and snobby was, was very important. So uh, where does, does this leave us in terms of political sociology and what might some of this mean for political sociology? Um, hopefully uh, it's evident that our approach is been able to add some kind of texture and some nuance to this kind of general debate about disengagement. Um, and you know, I think one of the, the key things that we bring to this is this, uh, these criticisms, you know, drawing attention to the, the kinds of criticisms that regular citizens have, um, calling for reform, for example, you know, problems with first past the post, these kinds of things. Um, and that separating out uh, this kind of critical and cynical stance from apathy, from just disinterest. Um, and as I was sort of saying earlier, this is really important in terms of shifting some of the responsibility for disengagement away from blaming individuals or dysfunctional communities, but thinking about the institutions and the systems and politicians and their responsibility in connecting with, with citizens as well. Um, and also, I think what comes through is the range of feelings and emotions that are part of electoral politics, feelings of disappointment, anger, disgust, um, you know, disconnection, sort of isolation. Uh, these are all quite, these kinds of things are, are typically not, not addressed when we talk about disengagement at that kind of macro um, quantitative sort of level. So what does this all mean? Where might we go um, from here? Um, what we're suggesting, I guess, is that sociology uh, 
should look at democracy, that we need to understand this political uh, disengagement from a sociological viewpoint, and that by doing so we can bring new insights into people's experiences of that disengagement. And why might it be important to do that? It might be important because sociology can play a, a key role in helping to provide a rounded understanding of that uh, political context and the disengagement which is a, is a major feature of it. And it can also help us to think how things uh, could be improved. And I guess the kind of approach that we are hopeful might uh, follow from this is an approach which is democratic, one that actually invites uh, debate and contributions from a wide range of people and a wide range of voices and not just from the political elite. And sociology is crucial in this process, not just in the kind of the technicalities or having uh, a definite um, idea about where we should go, but to just try and use the sociological imagination to imagine alternative uh, social and political futures. That part of what sociology is about is trying to how, imagine how things could be different from what they are and that that's absolutely central to what we're suggesting. And imagining how things can be different from what they are does also, we would argue, involve imagining how they might be better. And in our terms, we're suggesting that this might mean how things might be more egalitarian and how we might have a more engaged uh, political uh, landscape. This might sound quite optimistic, and I know that optimism is often seen as uh, rather than naive and not terribly intellectually serious, for which reason I'm writing a book called Sociology for Optimists, because I want to argue that optimism is an absolutial, absolutely crucial tool in our critical arsenal and that it's key in... Um, in our sociological imagination if we're really going to understand and change the world. And I want to leave you with this quote from C. Wright Wills to have a look at and see if that might um, give you some ideas on what our role might be. Thank you very much.